Hello everyone. First of all, my apologies for the late upload of this video. I did post a message on Patreon and also on the community tab over on YouTube just to let you know that this video would be delayed this week and wouldn't come out on Monday or Sunday evening on Patreon Monday uh, for YouTube. So as I say, just a rather busy weekend. I ended up being involved in the commissioning of a steam locomotive into passenger traffic. So that was uh, interesting, uh, a little bit different from obviously what we talk about on the channel, but it's another one of my hobbies. Anyway, getting on to the topic we're going to talk about in this video, and this is something I alluded to in previous videos. We're looking here at a the final pattern, the final version of the Helmet Steel Airborne Troops. This is a post Second War version, but is basically an example of the, the late war or the later war development of this helmet design. And we're going to talk a little bit about the helmet design itself in the video and obviously have a look at the details, particularly the liner and so forth, which are quite unique to this helmet design. Uh, so that's what we're going to have a look at now. So here we have it. This is an example of the Helmet Steel Airborne Troops Mark II. This is the final iteration of this design. Uh, it would be introduced in 1944, It'd be used right the way through into the 1970s. So it's the, the final development of this design, which had been slowly developed by increments during the course of the Second World War. Um, say finalized with this version of the helmet in 1944. You don't really see them in use much in 1944. They're more common uh, during, more commonly seen during Operation Varsity in 1945. So I say like a lot of these things, uh, just because introduced in 1944 doesn't mean it suddenly becomes common to see on the battlefield. Uh, there was a, a, obviously a, a period where the older patterns were being issued um, and you say you don't see a, a huge number of these in use uh, until 1945 and you do see more of them then. It's an improvement over the preceding designs. The shell is basically the same as the Mark I, uh, but you have a, a webbing chin strap in place of the leather, which was a definite improvement. Uh, otherwise, the liner is very similar to the Mark I as well. The shell is very different from the sort of standard issue British helmet, the standard issue infantry helmet, which was the, the Mark II at the start of the war. And of course, you then get the Mark III coming in to a degree during the course of the war, from mid-war onwards. Uh, both of those had quite wide brims, which really made them unsuitable for airborne use. And the liner and the chin strap and so forth, it would have needed significant modification to make those helmets suitable from that point of view as well, and secure enough on the head and to provide enough of sort of a impact resistance and so forth, make them enough of a crash helmet, I guess you could say, uh, which is one of the uh, elements of, a, of an airborne helmet is obviously it's also something of a hard hat to protect the, the head from, from bangs and knocks and so forth, as well as being a protective steel helmet from a military perspective. So for that reason, you have a very different helmet shell shape. Uh, the shape of the, the shell is basically shared with the Royal Armoured Corps helmet and of course the, the steel dispatch riders helmet, uh, but it's drilled differently to take the chin strap and so forth. You don't have a hole at the top to attach a liner. Obviously the Royal Armoured Corps pattern uses a standard sort of liner that you would also see used in the Mark, uh, Mark II and the Mark III. So you don't have that here because the liner is very different as we'll see in a minute. Just talking a little bit more about this from the outside before we look at the details of the liner and the chin strap. You can see this is painted with a very shiny gloss green, sort of a bronze green color. Uh, my supposition is this would be vehicle paint. It's very common post-war to see the same sort of paint as used on Land Rovers and other vehicles uh, used on helmets. You see uh, Mark IV helmets painted with this sort of shiny green finish uh, as we have here. Uh, my supposition is the same sort of paint. It's basically vehicle paints that, that's been used to paint this. Obviously generally would be worn with camouflage over the top. So the shiny paint is less of an issue in that regard. Looking inside here, you can see details of the chin strap and liner. And the big improvement over the Mark I with this was the Mark, it was the use of a webbing chin strap with the Mark, uh, Mark II, which you can see here. Black and brass fittings, as you can see, the buckles inside the helmet are also black and brass, as is the ring at the rear, which takes the, provides the third point of suspension for the, the chin strap and takes this long strap that then leads back to the chin cup. So the, the, Helmet is worn with the forehead up here. This goes under the chin and obviously the back of the head is here. A little bit of extra padding around the back of the neck there, as you can see. The chin cup uh, is lined with a chamois leather, as you can see here. I have a, an idea that this chin strap was added to the helmet, that the liner is quite heavily worn and the chin strap isn't. It's very clean. So I believe this may well have been added to the helmet to replace the, the worn out original. You can see this is marked here, dated 1955. The details of the manufacturer there on the chin strap. So this can be adjusted at the front using these two buckles. 
which have straps leading down to the chin cup. And then you have this long strap which runs around the front of the chin cup here, then back through this ring at the rear and back to this buckle here on the chin strap. So this is this is the buckle that's unfastened typically to, to uh, remove this and, and put it on. And then this would be pulled tight once the, the helmet was on to make sure it's nice and secure on the head. Um, so that's the chin strap arrangement in this uh, in, the, in the Mark II. You can see the details of the liner here. You can see at the top there we have a rubber pad and this is glued into the top of the helmet, which is why we don't have that screw on the outside. The, the, the top sort of uh, rubber pad, which is sort of the last resort of in, in any impact from above, uh, is this rubber pad that's glued into the top of the helmet there. The liner then has some similarity to the US M1 design. You have these tapes coming in, which are held together with a ring to provide the suspension in the top here that sits on top of the head. Uh, and of course, the US would adapt the M1 for airborne forces. They didn't need to come up with a completely new helmet design because the M1, given its profile, is suitable for use as an airborne helmet with modifications to the liner, which of course created the M1C. And the Germans, to a degree, modified the existing helmet as well, uh, taking off the, the, the brim of the style helm to produce their airborne helmet. So the, in terms of British forces, there was a bit more work required and, and obviously a very specific helmet design because of those issues with the, the Mark II. And then, of course, the Mark III sort of still had those issues and, and this helmet was in service, or the earlier iterations of this helmet were in service by that point anyway. Talking more about the liner, the liner, uh, the, the, the actual sort of sweat band and the padding here is held in the metal piece that fits in with the same screws and nuts that you can see here that attach the, the buckles for the chin strap. So you have these brass screws that pass through and then you have these brass hexagon nuts at the back that hold them in place. The same is true for the bracket at the rear and these also pass through this metal section here which holds the, the lower part of the liner in. You can see we have a leather sweat band here and then within that we have a white felt and behind that we have a, a stiffening piece of leather to which this rubber section is stitched and you, you then have that rubber padding around foam rubber padding around the outside here as you can see uh, which gives a good deal of padding around the head and makes this a very good sort of crash helmet i guess you could say from that point of view a key part of, of an airborne helmet design um, is to give that sort of shock protection to the head you can see here we have a number written in, which is not very clear, unfortunately, but you can see that here. If I get, allow the light in and get the chin strap out of the way, you can see that in there. And we do have a mark, we do have a stamp, a nice clear stamp on the liner here. If I can get the light in, you can hopefully see there. There we go, 1950. I'll pull this up here, put it at a better angle for the light to get onto it. There we go. So you can see the manufacturer, uh, CCL, the size seven and one eighth, and then the date there, 1956. Sorry, excuse me, 1956. So fairly typical. Um, I think CCL are a very common post-war manufacturer of these. And uh, the seven and one eighth is my size. Not that I plan to wear this very much. Obviously the, the liner, as you can see, is quite heavily worn. We have the a tear in the leather here where the leather's basically worn out at the back. So it's been quite heavily used. And as I say, it's my supposition therefore that the chin strap has been replaced. So that in a bit of detail, show you the in details of the liner and so forth. I think in a video, it's sometimes a little easier to see details than it is in photographs and so forth. And, and obviously these are well publicized, well documented, shall we say. Uh, there's a lot of information publicly available online of good books that cover these, of course. Uh, but uh, I thought having a look at one of these in the video, look, looking over the liner and so forth might be interesting. I'm sure many viewers are very familiar with these and this is no new information there covered in the video. But for those who aren't that familiar with these, hopefully this has been interesting. Hopefully it's been interesting irrespective. Uh, so there it is, the Helmet Steel Airborne Troops Mark II. And as I say, this is the sort of final iteration of this design. They got it right in 1944, and then it was in service right through into the 1970s. So uh, there it is. So I hope you found it interesting looking at this. As I noted in previous videos, this is a relatively recent arrival in the collection. I'm very happy to have it. Uh, say it's a post-war example, but a, a nice example, nice tidy example, a bit of wear to the liner, but otherwise very tidy. And as I say, very happy to have this in the collection. And hopefully you found it interesting looking at this in some detail in the video. If you have found this interesting and you'd like to see more of this sort of thing, please do consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. And whether you're newly subscribing or you've previously subscribed, please do make sure you hit the little bell, the notification button down below. That will, of course, alert you when I upload future videos. 
If you really like my uploads and you would like to support the channel, you can. Both Patreon and PayPal are linked down below. And as I always say, a massive thank you to everybody who supports the channel using those two methods. It really is greatly appreciated. Thank you all very much indeed. If you'd like to follow the channel on social media, you can. Facebook, Instagram and Twitter are all linked down below. And if you'd like to get in touch but you don't really use social media, there is of course an email address down there in the description as well. That's everything for this video. So until next time, bye for now.